trying not to use a microphone because of an extremely complicated streaming setup. So that doesn't work with microphones for some reason. So uh, let's uh, let's get going without a microphone. And I need to take a picture because you know, Mask is paying for all of this, and I'm you know here for words of the sponsor. So you know I I I, I count until three, and then you throw your hands up in the air, and I'll make a photo, and then everybody's happy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> or at least Mask is happy. One, two, three. Yay! Yay. Perfect, guys. Okay, <laughs> great. You should make it a selfie. Oh, shit. No, okay. <laughs> but, uh, thanks for coming. And kind of, you know, to my knowledge, it's the first data engineering meetup we have at MASP. Um, so I'm super happy to, to host uh, today. Um, I, I have no slides. I just show you this picture. And uh, I just want to say a couple of things. Of course, we're hiring. So, you know, if you're looking for a job, come talk to me or Andreas or somebody else at MASP. Um, our tech organization today has, uh, I think, 5,000 uh, people, so 5,000 people globally working on you know, software, technology, things like this. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a big moving ship, ship like our know, powerful ships or that. Um, and uh, just practical stuff, like, you know, there's pizza still outside and beer, so I hope that afterwards, you know, grab, grab a beer and grab a, a slice of pizza. We don't have any leftovers. Um, we don't have badges, so you don't have to return them. But uh, as you know, there's security, so you know, don't, don't try to wander around just uh, in the end, you know, just go through the exit and be nice, and then we can come back here if we want to and order more sodas because they were, were already out of sodas. Um, other than that, I, I have nothing to say. Just like, you know, we're really happy that you guys are coming. It's, it's a great turnout, and I hope we can have some discussion you know, during the talks, after the talks, and uh, welcome to MESC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very complicated setup. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna give me your original. No, you don't need to. Just <laughs> now share it over this because you need to. Do you think it works? I hope. Previously, you brought in your own. Yeah, I I'll take this opportunity to also say that as a co organizer working for Leo Pharma, Leo Pharma is also hiring. <laughs> <laughs> But we have to set up pizza. Should we just make a list of companies? I think we'll get it. structure but also try to reach some benefit from having a platform centralized where you have uh, access to almost not all the data in bank but roughly 300 applications mm -hmm. using it so it's a pretty good start uh, if you want to try to dig into uh, what possibilities you have with data mesh um, just a brief one starting in case there's some people that are not aware of what Kafka does uh, it's uh, just easy to give it as plus right um, you apply after no pub sub, rub it on a point to point connection between applications. Uh, you use it as a buffer in between. There's a retention period where the events are stored. Um, and uh, you pretty much have a contract of publishing a message to a topic, which is a call into Kafka, but in essence, it switches the disk, right? Um, and then it's there for a period of time, and someone or more than one consumer can read this message at the end of the day. Right? So that is the And Kafka is an open source uh, technology. Um, however, if you work in a corporate setting, usually you need to have some kind of enterprise support and these kind of things. So there's a company called Confluence who takes this uh, open source part of Kafka, enterpriseifies it, offers it as a middleware support, and then sells it to 
company, so that would probably be a use. Um, and on top of that, we have built uh, our own layer where we can apply these uh, data mesh concepts, right? So data governance, data federation, um, data discovery, all of that. Um, so that is sort of the setup uh, that we have for this laptop. And one of the sort of core concepts of the data mesh is that it's supposed to be self-service. You, don't, you shouldn't have someone that be, or a platform or something being involved, like for example, uh, who wants to expose your data or you want to manage your data. Or whatever, right? It should be uh, up to the person or the team or the application that owns the data to decide whether uh, it should be shared with other applications or uh, if it should not be, or if it's just internal data right, for the application. Um, so this is a view of uh, this uh, abstraction we have made from the uh, data streams or guarantee that the data that is here is actually good data. And of course, it doesn't have good data citizens, but if it's big enough, there are going to be people that probably give you bad data, right? So there needs to be some quality in that sense, right? Um, another part of the data mesh, which I already touched a bit, uh, is that uh, it should be domain-oriented <coughs> ownership of the data. Uh, me, who is part of building this platform, I have no clue about this data. I shouldn't need to know any about this because it's the people who uh, publish this data that have the domain knowledge. They should be the ones who uh, decide on what data is needed from that application. They should decide on who is allowed to read that data. Uh, they should uh, decide on what schema, and then uh, they should also be the ones deciding uh, on. Uh, uh, yeah, but they should be deciding more or less everything. And this uh, example, this is just showcasing uh, the abstraction that I made of these event streams with the different types of uh, actions you can perform. So you can see there's a box um, tick that says that it's approved by a data asset owner, and each of these domains have a data asset owner, um, and they have priority status. This is the distinction we have made between allowing 
uh, developers to get up and running quickly, start doing whatever they want to do, versus uh, sort of the final product where they have established uh, what data they want to publish as a sort of the golden source of that type of data. Right? And uh, this is a distinction we've made just to try to keep up and have a high data quality uh, for these sources that people actually trust that this is the uh, good data that we can use for the purpose, right? Um, so the distinction we've made is something we call uh, private public and public private. In that case, there is no public data, it's just software, uh, so it's just a layer rather than top. Um, but basically, a uh, private public, you can do whatever you want, you don't share it, and there is a case for it as well. If, uh, this Kafka, you can use it internally in your application as well, right? There might not be a need to share this data with other applications. Maybe you have a bunch of microservices in your solution, you need to cascade some events. Uh, there should also be a way to do that without getting involved with this uh, approval process and data governance, right? Because it's just internal data in your application. No one needs to bother, right? Um, but once uh, maybe you have it set up, uh, read from a bunch of topics, so get your data from some other system, uh, do some calculation within your application, and then when you finally have enriched that with whatever you need, and you've decided that this is the data that we should expose to the rest of the bank, then you actually have to go this, through this approval step where someone can look at emails data, okay, this is feasible, this is a good setup, this is what the best few consumers are interested in, this is actually useful, useful data that you're publishing, right? Um, so that's the distinction we made to try to give them a lot of flexibility and uh, not to be a um, blocker, but try to still keep a We have done after this is in place. So now we're having around 300 applications uh, that are publishing their data onto our Kafka platform, and that of course uh, offers downstream consumers to get those events in near real time. Uh, however, there's a lot of uh, different needs and different integration patterns that the bank relies on. For example, a lot of applications require to get a snapshot, for example, of all the trades during the day, and they can make a case, of course, that there should be a consumer at the end of the topic that should consume the, all the events throughout the day. Maybe they have some stored in memory or dump them to a data, database uh, as a snapshot themselves. Um, that's said before. We are trying to uh, make it easier for uh, developers to actually focus on building something that adds value to the business rather than uh, coming up with solutions that is going to be uh, more or less replicated by a lot of other teams as well because it's not going to be one team that needs to do this. A lot of teams need to do this in case that, will, that was a need for the business, right? So then you would have a bunch of teams <coughs> creating a bunch of topics, building their own services, hosting them, and exposing some kind of uh, snapshot query API, right? Which is a lot of work, and then the teams need to maintain these kind of solutions, right? Um, so what we did uh, was to try and leverage uh, a bunch of the components that are part of the Kafka ecosystem. Uh, so Kafka is the main part of uh, the Kafka ecosystem, right? Uh, they also have uh, a bunch of other services and components they can use. So one is called Kafka Connect. Kafka Connect Simplified is uh, a Kit framework given a JSON configuration and um, some credentials. Uh, you will be able to spin up a worker hosted by us that uh, can do anything from uh, reading from a Oracle database, dumping it to Kafka, the opposite. So sync a source, uh, can do Snowflake, can be, a, I think there's like 350 different variations and different technologies you can do, right? Um, so this eliminates the need for uh, other people to develop these kind of components, whereas uh, they can choose then, for example, to, uh, if you need to do some additional processing of your data, or if you have a need for a historical lookup instead, um, you can choose, for example, that either you dump it to a Oracle database, or you can dump it straight to HDFS, uh, or whatever you want to dump it, right? Um, but uh, if you, if some of you work in a corporate setting as well, uh, trying to, well, not trying to, but if you order uh, your own infrastructure, trying to order the database in these things, or if you kind of store that up, right? Uh, there's a cost, there is, uh, it's kind of cumbersome, it takes some time. Uh, so what we tried to do was to uh, eliminate that so that people can just go on with their lives, just click a button basically, and it will then solve a lot of their problems. Um, so at the top here you see the same picture you saw before with the Kafka, um, and what we decided to do was to utilize this Kafka uh, Connect framework, which I said is just a consumer basically that reads from what, uh, the topic that you specify, takes all the events and dumps them into, in this case, HBase. Um, I'm running on 
probably the right term. Um, and when you do that, you tell, um, so let's say you have a event for the service team, right? And you know that you want to be able to query historically these events by uh, a certain ID and a short name, for example, that are part of the team, right? You only have Peter and UI in the course of this before. You just have to specify that, okay, you want to, uh, you want the composite key in HBase to be made up from uh, this field and this field. Check it. It will start persisting all the messages into a table in HBase, and we have a generic gRPC query API already running. So just by clicking that, you already have all your future data going into that table and you will be able to query it right away through uh, do historical lookup on that same data that you have available um, uh, in your real time on the topic. Uh, basically eliminating the need for anyone to uh, create their own services and create a query API that should be highly available and these kind of things. Right? Uh, it solves a lot of like annoying things that a lot of people will have to develop the same thing. Um, of course, this can, uh, if you have access to the Kafka Connect, uh, maybe have a different need for a different storage. As I said, uh, it, it's very possible to just uh, dump this to Snowflake or whatever and other place you want your data to be. Right? Uh, so by having this uh, initial uh, structure of the uh, portal that we have with the data, uh, national data governance, of course, we can utilize a lot of that to gain more value than just having this near real time uh, data streams that we already use. Of course, there's still plenty of applications that rely only on the near real time, and that's fine. Maybe they have other, other needs. But there are plenty of uh, applications that the other need to do these sort of lookups, especially, uh, or just have the possibility to store uh, their events for more than uh, the default detention of Kafka W is roughly two weeks. It can be configured depending on the size of how many events you do, but by default it's two weeks. And the regulatory uh, measures sometimes you need to keep the data for like five years, ten years, these kind of things, right? So it also eliminates the need for you to have some kind of uh, database where you would have to store your events and related to all events or audit purposes or whatever, right? Uh, so it's really convenient uh, feature that we made. Uh, another one um, that is, uh, I would say it's catering also <laughs> might mainly to uh, developers, but you can also argue that it uh, you know, increases uh, the quality of your tests and uh, hopefully you would find more bugs in the test management rather than finding out the pro. <clears throat> so a lot of teams struggle with uh, trying to convince business to uh, produce uh, pr basically production or similar data to production in the test environment. Usually teams are stuck with low quality data in the test environment, right? And it's really annoying to try and run your test or do some kind of calculation, especially if you depend on like 30 different uh, data streams in production and then you need to convince 30 different teams to publish this data in the test environment. It's not going to happen, right? Um, so what we did uh, was again to utilize this uh, Kafka Connect framework, but um, instead of routing all the messages to a, a storage server, to sync, uh, we reroute the messages to a different data stream on a different topic. And we can do this cross environment, right? Of course, it's a shitty idea to have production data in the heap, but uh, it is allowed if you obfuscate sensitive data. And that is what we've done. So you can also decide here, obviously in uh, accordance with the data as a donor of production, who knows, has the domain knowledge, knows which fields are uh, sensitive or you can not uh, dump from production to UP. Um, you can then go in and choose to obfuscate those fields and then get the exact same events uh, to the test environment where you can run your uh, test. And then you would have the exact same volumes, you would have the same peaks, and it will give you a much closer um, experience to what the would be. Uh, and of course, uh, if you need to get this different data streams, you probably need to do some representation on the test side. So we offer a way to uh, you can hash the values, so we're still able to do the same mapping that you do uh, in production, but you wouldn't have the actual values, right? But you're still able to perform the same. Uh, okay, you match. You can always go back and match. For example, if you want to figure out uh, if something is going wrong for a certain client, right? Uh, and if you do a reconciliation or we can show the settlement on the uh, backside, then uh, you are not going to find out who did it, but you know which hash is the erroneous uh, one. And if you have people on the business side or operations side, they're actually, because I guess most of you guys are familiar with the segregation of duty part as well, uh, I'm not allowed to see production things, but someone in production is able to apply the same hash function on that value and know which customer did it, right? Uh, so 
that is one of the convenience things we made, but it's also making life easier for a lot of developers to accommodate uh, and find the various things that they wouldn't bump into because, uh, I mean, uh, to some degree, I'm also lazy in that sense, right? It's, if it takes too much time to uh, meet the same needs, I mean, it's just impossible to get the exact same data they wouldn't like, right? So this is just a convenient and easy way for you to get and generate the test data that you would uh, otherwise have to generate in a different way, right? Um, yeah, that was what I was uh, planning to present today. Uh, you guys have any questions about anything Kafka related or uh, Atom related or anything? Yeah? Uh, I'm actually interested in the reason for choosing gRPC in front of HBase. All right. Uh, because it's also, it, it's not it's not event based, right? It, it, uh, no, 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 exactly. So the the, the GRPC uh, uh, service is, uh, is just events dumped into an HBase cable, right? Okay. And then uh, exposed as a query guide for historical lookups, basically. Right. Uh, so uh, I don't exactly know the reason for why we chose gRPC. Uh, we have a similar service uh, that uses gRPC, so it might be why, because I've played with it before. Um, but uh, what you can do easily also, even with the gRPC layer, uh, just if you need, for example, if you have vendor applications that only speak REST, right? Just add a REST layer on top, right? right. Then that's what you, a lot of people do as well, because uh, maybe they want to apply some of their own so basically, this gRPC endpoint inherits the um, ACLs of a Kafka token. Okay. So if you order the set of the governance, who should be able to read this data, they're also able to read the historical uh, data, right? right? That inherits that one. But if you want to add another layer on top, for example, uh, maybe uh, the legacy or the vendor systems that aren't allowed to, uh, able to read from Kafka, maybe you don't want to add it as the ACL because it's not a reader. So then you can have your own REST layer on top, say that, okay, these guys are allowed to do whatever they want, and they query on behalf of, right? Okay. So that's just one option. And um, how do you make sure? Because there's also a schema already um, on Kafka, right? And GRPC yeah. has its own like services and messages that you need to basically define. Uh, so uh, in this Kafka ecosystem, there is a, a one component called schema registry. Right. That is the one coordinating scheme. So uh, if you try to publish something to a topic on Kafka, uh, which has a, a defined schema already, mm -hmm. uh, it will get rejected if uh, it doesn't match that schema, right? And when you dump that to, I mean, H, uh, this uh, uh, dumping to HBase just bites, just dumps it, right? So it doesn't interpret anything, right? And when you retrieve it through the GRPC uh, interface, also bites. And then once you have consumed that message, then you will utilize, you know, uh, you have queried for this data, then you know that the event will match this schema, right? Right. Ah, okay. So, so, it's, so, it's, so it's a bytes field that you use in the GRPC schema, as in like it's just random, you don't actually break it down to strings or to. No, ex exactly. For, so Kafka only talks in bytes also. Right? Even if you have a schema on Kafka, it just bytes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when we write in this, it just bytes. Yeah. It might be a, be a, be a bit simple, but, but Kafka, as it dormant, looks like it, it's a queue, a message queue. But, yeah. but, 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 but is that or, or, or is it actually a stream? No, it's an event streaming platform. It's okay. an event streaming so, platform, yeah. But, but, but this one was, uh, did you? Can a message be consumed multiple times or yeah, re so reconsumed or, or how yeah. much it, 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 Kafka is in essence an append log, right? Yeah. And it's written to this. And uh, there's, a con a point there's a conflict of yeah. consumer groups and they can individually uh, either, you know, they can change the offset yeah. and this is another way to read, they can reread the entire thing. So they, it's up to them to decide on how they want to consume it. Okay. Yes. Confluence replicator, but uh, not the uh, so it's a bit funny because they have two not products but two things that are called replicators. So one is the replicator they had before when they replicated between different Kafka clusters, right? Yeah. Uh, this is not this one. This is a Kafka Connect replicator, uh, which we have built a custom single message transform, which is generic, which enables us to do this uh, orchestration pretty much. Okay. So the host one doesn't support, for example, nested. If you have a schema that's nested, yeah. it doesn't support it. So if you want to be able to associate nested fields, then we need to do your custom schema. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because uh, given that you work in a bank, I'm yeah. guessing you might also have IBM MQ queues in yeah. your organization. Yeah. Have you had any experience with uh, consuming MQ data or publishing to MQ? So that was my first question. Yeah. My yeah. second question, do you have uh, some war stories of mistakes you made? Uh, maybe some stories about what not to do? Or what you can um, I can tell you that the JDBC connector is performing horribly, that I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> Um, there is a connector for, and so uh, basically for uh, IBM MQ, uh, what they usually do if, because there is a directive coming from, I mean, obviously I, I'm not going around convincing people to publish a data capture, there's a directive coming from top, so people actually do it, right? Uh, but uh, some of the IBM MQ data, uh, what they do is either that they have a, their own service consuming that one and then publish it into Kafka, or they utilize one of the Kafka, uh, there is an IBM source pin connector, right? So you can plug in your MQ and have your uh, events uh, run into Kafka, mm -hmm. which works pretty fine. I'm sending them up the MQ for So that was actually okay performance and a staple thing. Um, so uh, if you want to just plug that on and check it out. Yeah. Uh, but not the data if you want. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so you can use pin config to uh, Uh, no, so, um, uh, it's only offered um, in combination with our platform. So, um, uh, for example, it does, uh, it only, it's a bit funny also because it's Confluent, right? Mm -hmm. So, it supports Confluent Avro, for example. But not Avro. Yeah, actually. So, um, it is a bit, uh, we have had a bunch of other teams asking if they can use our schema registry purely for the purpose of storing or versioning schemas, right? Because that's what it's good at. Um, but uh, for now, we've said basically, if you want to do that, then you need to use Kafka. I mean, you, you don't use uh, schema registry only as a separate component, right? It is possible to expose uh, the uh, interface for uh, schema registry just using that. But uh, for uh, not security bugs, but for the um, uh, ACLs to be a fire, so that is not going to be the wild west. Everyone just uploading schemas, right? So we tie that to the ACLs of Kafka, which is a security model, right? So that is what makes it a bit annoying or difficult to have people just use schema registry as yeah. their entry. So that's the, but it's, it's possible to do it, it's just possible. I'm curious, through your organizational, uh, if you want to, or if a group wants to make schema breaking changes, how do you handle that? So um, the producer who publishes the data, is uh, sort of owning the con apart from the actual Kafka contract with acknowledgement and nothing, they own uh, that data. Right? So if they need to make a break and change the schema, it's their responsibility to notify. I mean, uh, we visualize uh, who their consumers are uh, with the application code, which people they can contact, but we don't interfere in that. I mean, Kafka is essentially a dumb pipe. I don't need to know anything. Just shovel back the bugs. Just shovel bugs. It's, it's what it does. Right? So I don't want to get involved with that. So. The con we offer the Kafka contract, we offer the way for people to govern their own data, we offer the way for them to uh, transparently see what's going on with the data, but uh, I don't get involved, uh, with, I mean, we're talking about three developers and we have to support three other applications. I can't get involved with these kind of things because I mean, that's the only thing I will do, that's to support them. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, so, uh, it's basically up to the producer to choose. If you're using schema registry, is that the right? You, uh, you can uh, you can actually if you have the that policy applied yes we can change the policy to none and they can do whatever you want so it's uh, uh, up to the producer again who owns the topic they can choose that for example it should always be backward compatible for the schemas and then that's a security you have as a consumer to know that okay it's whatever they apply right but uh, if you have a Communication layer, uh, thank you. Um, why do you think that communication layer is such a better service than most other services that we offer internally? Uh, 
I don't know if I give the impression that, but I think it's because it was uh, built with limited amount of people. Um, some teams that build a solution and they get a huge budget and then how do we solve it? I, I don't think it's five more people, right? And because then when you do on, pick up onboarding to the platform, I don't, if someone onboards, I don't even know. I don't even know if someone onboards to the platform right now because I don't want to be involved in this kind of thing because it takes too much time. Right? If I need to handhold everyone who starts using the platform, it's not feasible. Then we need to scale organizationally with people, right? And it's, it's not possible. So we prefer to have a, uh, some sort of uh, developer guide that's thorough. We have examples, we have a well example of all the kind of, sort of interaction pattern, uh, integration patterns. Uh, we've done that from the beginning and then it's just easier to maintain it than trying to take a platform now that's not built with self-service in mind and just revamp it and try to come up with something around it. It's just probably difficult to convince the business people to we need to make this really of the platform. Right? We're not gonna like so uh, if you started with it in mind and I wasn't there when the project started so uh, some other people like for that but uh, it's uh, uh, I think that was the key part. Um, there, was, there was a small team and they had the vision of that this is what needs to be done and it's not feasible because we're only gonna be three people we can't scale uh, organization with you know 20 people that some projects do right and um, so that then it's kind of becomes the only way to have the self-service and automate it rather than having to do a lot of manual steps in the way because then as i said you're only going to do support and have help um as you mentioned that the, the, the schemas that you define rather than users define is ever yeah. changing so when you talk about data quality uh, data quality will bring the data in and that data quality checks as well when you are predicting the data to the consumers. Do you have a framework? Like how do you really design that? Because the landscape around the data is always changing. So it does also mean that the checks that you implement do also change and the consumer does not have control on that. So how do you really implement that? So how we implemented the, uh, the approval process or how you get a schema approved or how we how we propagate the change or which? Um, how do you propagate the changes? Of course, I mean, it's, it's the data landscape keeps changing. Yeah. The uh, data checks, the logic behind the checks also, they do keep changing, right? Yeah. So um, how do you handle that? Because generally, I mean, uh, you kind of maybe implement a framework that uh, uses some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, oh, sorry. It uses maybe some kind of a language that would implement these checks. Now, since the data landscape changed, the logic also in the backend changes. Now, how do we handle that dynamically? I mean, in terms of the schema changing and uh, versioning of schema, we, uh, we don't handle that. This schema uh, registry component yeah, that yeah. handles the versioning, right? So, uh, if if they decide to start using a new schema, if it's uh, uh, with a policy that allows them to maybe it's backward compatible, but they publish a new schema, and then there's that's all oh, there is. It doesn't. It isn't. Uh, it isn't pushed to consumers, right? It's just uh, being updated in the schema registry, and that's the one that's usable. Um, and then when you run the data quality checks, we we run our own data quality checks on our data. It's our responsibility. Yeah. So if, oh. if you own it, I I have no clue what data checks I should do on trade data. I have no clue. I don't know any facts. Uh, it's okay. a so that's kind of the domain owner's responsibility. Yeah, exactly. So the schema you get approved is involving the data as a developer and a enterprise architect that thinks it's a good idea to expose the data in this way, right? That's the check that is done. And if you want to revise your schema or change, maybe you want to change your format even, right? Then that's, you have to go through that process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the, the, the data platform. So I'm interested what kind of technology you use to build this data form, for example, how you help the, the consumers and all the producers to connect with them together and how you provision infrastructure for them. What kind of technology do you use? Uh, I mean, the, the, this portal that you're seeing is just a uh, Java backend with some React uh, front, right? So it's nothing fancy going on. Sorry, it's like building on Kubernetes or Cluster. Uh, it, this one is running on Kubernetes. The, this, this platform is running on Kubernetes. Uh, the Kafka cluster is not running on Kubernetes because in a bank it's a bit cumbersome to run a Kafka cluster on Kubernetes. Uh, it's running on regular VMs on prem. Uh, but this uh, self service uh, portal and the Kafka Connect framework and a bunch of components of the Kafka ecosystem that we run on Kubernetes on uh, <laughs> hybrid cloud. 
I think we're going to take one more question. So, so on this, uh, okay, it's not. Uh, if you scroll down a bit on this one, you, see, you can see description at the bottom there. <laughs> so usually, uh, what people do is uh, that they have a uh, maybe an internal confluence page or something that has more in-depth uh, details about the event or the type. Uh, Druid as a, as a whole a trust pilot 
and uh, uh, a little bit of demo. I'll break the ice here. We haven't had the demo in the last few sessions, so hopefully that goes well. <laughs> and uh, a few a few learnings, good and bad, uh, because we can have only good uh, experiences. Uh, just to, if it's okay, uh, how many people have heard about Ruby? Awesome. And how many people use it in production? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, how many people have heard about ClickHouse or uh, Apache Pinot? Awesome. This is great. So what is the problem that uh, our CTO presented to us? Well, we, uh, he wanted the whole organization to be data-driven and transparent, and he wanted to turn our data into knowledge. This is not to say that we did not have, uh, we did not have data analysts, but this sort of uh, data was uh, Executives to uh, internal stakeholders, but uh, not necessarily to the rest of our organization. So, commercial department, product teams to some extent, they have to do their own efforts and so on. So, how did we tackle this issue? Uh, but first of all, some of the initial requirements that uh, that we had was pretty much having some sort of reporting. So, the typical 30, 90, 180 days, but also some some sort of time series data. So the way we, uh, the initial architecture looks something like this, and uh, you might have seen these two boxes here, so AWS and GCP, we are multi-cloud. Uh, our big data initiatives are being developed in uh, GCP, and all the transactional stores, web applications, uh, are running uh, within uh, AWS. So what we have here is pretty much uh, some pre-processing being done by uh, by Dataflow, by a Dataflow job, uh, which is triggered by Airflow, uh, an Airflow DAG, uh, and that Dataflow job job run uh, more than a dozen queries against uh, BigQuery, and then is pushing them to uh, to Dynamo, which uh, uh, then is it is being served. Uh, Towards this uh, this web application to be consumed by uh, by our users. Um, how how do, does the data modeling look in uh, in Dynamo? Where uh, where we use the uh, Dyn How many people are familiar with the Dynamo data modeling? Awesome. So we use uh, uh, a single table design. So uh, the all this is uh, in a single table. Those uh, gray boxes are our uh, uh, primary key, uh, and then uh, the sort key is uh, divided by uh, a hashtag, so you can have uh, this access pattern of, uh, this is the, let's say, business unit ID, which is an entity within Trustpilot, and give me the referral traffic for the month of uh, December, for example, uh, 2019. And this is how a query might uh, look look like from our uh, web application. Now, this was pretty popular within Trustpilot. Uh, it had a huge uh, impact, enabling everyone to have access to the data. So a lot of questions start coming uh, from the business uh, around having more flexibility around which dimensions they want to select, which, uh, which, types of, uh, uh, which type of filters uh, they want to have. But also, uh, they wanted to, uh, sometimes we're not we might not have data about businesses uh, for longer than 30 days. So they want to drill down into those 30 days instead of, instead of having like a 12 month uh, view. This is not to say that uh, Dynamo is not capable of that, but storing all this uh, analytical data in a key value store, you will have to do a lot of pre-processing. So from just 12 entries for refer referral traffic, and we had a lot of data points uh, this will blow up into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of uh, entries to uh, pre-process or data points to pre-process and, uh, and serve. So uh, after some deliberation on how to uh, how to solve this uh, issue of time uh, drilling down into data in, into the time series data, but also have more flexibility in uh, uh, slicing and dicing data. Uh, we came across uh, Druid, so pretty quick definition from the Druid uh, uh, blog. Uh, 
but it, it, it allows you pretty much to write analytical queries uh, at scale. And uh, when we looked at uh, Druid, we were also interested to see how uh, which companies are using the, uh, Druid in the wild. So uh, as our use case was uh, companies like Pinterest, Game Analytics, this Druid is powering their internal analytical dashboard that they are presenting to their customers. Uh, for example, Verizon is using it uses it for their uh, networking uh, analytics uh, and then um, also companies like Airbnb, Netflix, Twitch, they uh, also use it as a, a online tool in, uh, in this case. So the reason why we ended up uh, using Druid other than the big support in the community is also that uh, it presented the ability to um, have flexibility when flexibility on, on your dimensions, but also have time series granularity. And one important thing for us was also the uh, low latency, so the 90% of had to be seconds whenever someone was uh, requesting uh, any sort of data. And the other important thing was the knowledge within the company. And this is where we had a uh, principal engineer who came from Woodmac, they deal with uh, oil wells, so they were interested in about the data and built in aggregation using so this is just the present, so looking into the future, it was also very important for us to move from a batch model, which we saw earlier in, in, in the architecture, to a more uh, stream model and uh, get into uh, near real-time aggregations in, uh, and data, but also having the ability to integrate the different uh, BI tools. So uh, something like Redash, uh, Druid can integrate with it, um, uh, Looker, and also if you are on the open source bus, it, uh, it also integrates really well with um, a superset. Now, what we did in the new architecture is we replaced the data flow job with, uh, um, with really just uh, running the, the queries as, uh, uh, well, running the queries through some operator in Airflow and then pushing the data to the Druid cluster. Uh, so the Druid cluster has multiple components which we are going to go into. Uh, the, the other bit that we did here was uh, we introduced a, uh, an analytics API, so this uh, is meant to abstract as much of the boilerplate that you would otherwise need to uh, query data from Druid, but also allow more uh, security, flexibility and scalability. Uh, and this allowed us to uh, to meet all the new requirements that we were coming uh, that were coming from uh, our business users. How does Druid look under the hood? So, for example, you have multiple nodes. Uh, you have the master node, but uh, you have the deep storage. So, for example, in our case, this is uh, S3. Um, Druid has uh, a concept called uh, segments. That's where it stores the data. Uh, and the data is being ingested. Uh, so this is where uh, Airflow will push uh, data towards the data node. Uh, we have uh, data nodes which uh, serve real-time data, but we also spin up, uh, when we have our batch job, we, we spin up new EC2 instances just for uh, ingestions. Ingestion, and then we get it uh, uh, back down. So for example, uh, in order to query the data, this is where our uh, analytics API will make a request to the broker and the broker, uh, based on where the coordinator would tell it to find the data. So for example, let's just say the one on the left is where our real data is in, uh, in memory, for example, before it's being dumped to disk and put to deep storage. Um, or if it knows that they have some historical uh, nodes here to go and take the data from the other one. So the coordinator tells the broker where to find the, the segment that you need for a certain interval. So let's say the last week or January. And so on. Uh, this is the type of, uh, I hope everyone can look this uh, in the back, but this is the type of uh, ingestion spec that we pass in our um, Druid operator, so uh, if you're using Airflow, Druid has an operator out of the box. So for example, uh, we, again, this is batch, so we have uh, some Airflow operators which are dumping data into a GCF bucket, and uh, this is where in the ingestion spec, GCF bucket is being uh, to, of course, with this privilege uh, and all the other systems we best practices. Uh, 
we, we have multiple uh, multiple entries in this uh, object. So we have our data source. So a data source is pretty much uh, a table. Uh, we have the granularity spec. So what the granularity spec is is um, is when whenever you have the broker that needs to decide to go to a segment, you would want those segments to have to be optimized. So ideally, you would have, let's say, they recommend uh, around five million rows per uh, per segment, or between three hundred and seven hundred megabytes. So, for example, for each uh, so each uh, each new record of that uh, that's a segment. So, for example, for each day in this case, we are specifying that segment should only contain a day, and when the next day comes, a new segment will be created. And the query granularity, and this is very important, will be a day. So, in case you want to go to uh, the granularity of an hour, that will not be possible because the granularity spec is uh, when the investment happens, uh, it's mentioned by day. Uh, the other interesting bit here is the roll-up, so in, through it you can do uh, roll-up and ingestion time, so in case you have uh, an event coming uh, uh, from Kafka and two or three dimensions uh, look the same, uh, Druid can roll up that and it will count the entries to if it matches the, the segment configuration and uh, that's how, that's some of the optimization that uh, Druid does. So can uh, have a fast response to your query. And then we have some dimensions and some metrics, uh, in this case, uh, event type and uh, the metric uh, will be count. Of course, here we have uh, about 20 dimensions on, on this specific uh, event. Uh, so instead of querying um, uh, Dynamo, right now this is the type of query that people will have to write to retrieve any sort of data. So there is a lot of flexibility in uh, uh, internal uh, <coughs> internal consumers to uh, query data from Druid and uh, retrieve uh, fast aggregations. So for example, in some of the scenarios we are saying, uh, give me the data between 7th of uh, August and 7th of September. I want it to be a top N. Um, and uh, a, a top end type of query, and then I want you to return it, uh, return some metrics. So these are some post um, or pre ingestion metrics that we pre aggregate, so we don't put as as much heavy load on uh, on Druid during the ingestion. And then we are saying uh, return uh, the UD value as a as a dimension, and then we are saying we only are interested on the most popular widgets for the full symphony ID. Uh, another query that people do is, uh, let's say, between uh, July 1st and uh, at... Uh, okay, this is a little bit wrong, uh, because uh, the dates are... No, actually it's a weird difference, sorry. So what we are doing here is, uh, is that uh, uh, Drew should go uh, 12 months uh, back in time and return aggregations for those metrics and the response will be, let's say, uh, 12, um, 12 objects within an array and they will be uh, grouped by, by month. So this is how you would achieve uh, the type of time, time series uh, responses <coughs> that uh, would otherwise be pretty hard to implement key values for. And then we are filtering by some So where do we use Trustpad? Uh, where do we use uh, we use Trustpad? Of course. But uh, <laughs> where do we use Druid Dr today in Trustpilot? So we are powering the web analytics uh, application that uh, you saw earlier in uh, uh, in the diagram. We are also using it for fraud and reporting. So our uh, trust and transparency department have quick aggregations on widgets which are might be labeled as uh, uh, fraudulent by our uh, fraud engines. This also allows us to aggregate uh, API calls being made by our partners, so uh, get posts, uh, how long it took, so we can analyze uh, uh, if we can improve somehow our collaboration with our partners, so maybe a, them making a million API calls might not be better, we can move towards a potential batch uh, type of uh, approach once a, a day. 
for a week. We are currently exploring with our ML ops team um, how to potentially use uh, Druid for uh, uh, adding features to our uh, online feature store. And uh, our data analysts are all also interested to get uh, some real time uh, reporting, uh, for example, in, uh, in Luca. So these are two use cases that we are exploring today. And uh, I should stop showing the presentation and go a little bit into the Druid console. So this is how the Druid console uh, looks like. Um, we are running version 0 0.20. We have. Uh, by the way, this is uh, some disclaimers. This is synthetic data and it's our staging environment. So we've been uh, playing a little bit uh, uh, with it and not everything might be optimal. We have 22 data sources. So we have 22 tables uh, within this cluster. Uh, we have 14,000 segments, uh, again, different sizes, uh, uh, a day segment, a month segment, uh, an hour segment and, uh, and so on and some other uh, services and tasks. Uh, you can ingest data from uh, from Kafka and uh, Kinesis uh, Event uh, Hub in uh, in real time, but uh, also you can use uh, blob storage like S3, GCS, uh, Azure Data Lake, uh, ADFS for uh, batch ingestion. Uh, you can also uh, there will be some use cases where um, you might have seen in companies when you go too far back in time they you will have to roll out the data a little bit to the market you can go to granular you can do it's encouraged to do something like this in druid as well where you might have your granular data for 90 days but then if you go further than 90 days you can roll up to a day or a month going back three years four years five years and, uh, and so on so that's a, that's a good practice for fast queries um, Currently, we have configured a, a Kinesis stream, so we are getting some real data. Hope, so the data that I will have in the last tab, hopefully there will be some reviews coming through. They are coming from our end-to-end -end tests, but uh, if not, it, it is real data that I will show you. Trust me. Um, this is how the data sources uh, look in, uh, in Druid. So for example, uh, there are no segments that, uh, that have been dropped. Uh, again, this is not optimized at, at all. Uh, so in general, you will have 5 million, uh, ideally 5 million or maximum 5 million rows per, per segment and then uh, 300 to 700 but the, uh, megabytes in sizes. But ideally, the most important thing is to have uh, uh, or the 5 million rows take precedence uh, compared to the size of the segment. And uh, we have some segments from our real uh, time data source here. So as you can see per minute, if I'm not mistaken here, uh, no, per hour, uh, we have around 10 reviews coming from our end -end tests. Uh, it's not a lot of data here, again, synthetic data staging environment. So for example, uh, we can have some Can you, can you zoom in a lot? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, good. One more, two more. <laughs> so for, for example, what uh, we're doing here is pretty much ingesting some uh, events from Kinesis, but it can be, it, it can be Kafka as well. Uh, we have our uh, uh, time column uh, we have our, uh, we have a few dimensions, so business unit, uh, ID, and language, and then we have some uh, uh, average. Uh, uh, we, we are doing an average on stars, but these are single uh, events. So, for example, if we wanted to say, hey, you know what? Uh, ideally, this would be like hundreds of millions of, uh, of events or tens of millions of events, but we can say, hey, you know what? I actually want to get the average per hour for this business. So right now for 7 p.m. 
we are getting an average of two stars and uh, for 8 p.m. we are getting an average of, uh, of five stars. And uh, you can see the responses on the uh, response time on the right side. Again, again, this is a small data set and it's not even optimized, but it returns in about uh, half a second. Now, one of the things uh, before moving into another example is that um, our API or the uh, data that we are passing to our uh, Druid broker uh, from our analytics API is not SQL, is uh, uh, JSON. So one, uh, one way we uh, go around this and make our lives easier, easier as uh, developers is that we say explain query. So pretty much here we get the projection of the uh, JSON payload that we would otherwise pass to the Druid broker to get an identical example in our response from the, uh, an identical result as a response from our um, API. Now, if we are to put the time aside and say I want to get the, so we could say we have a business unit ID, we have the language, but we are not interested in the time. We just want to get for the past three days the businesses that got the most uh, reviews. So we can do that uh, as well, really fast. And we can see that this business unit uh, uh, received uh, seven reviews in, in the past uh, three days. Again, uh, synthetic data uh, staging environment, but uh, this works as fast in, uh, in production. And then we can do some more advanced queries where uh, it's pretty hard to do uh, not pretty hard, but pretty uh, compute intensive to do uh, funnel analysis in, uh, for example, your data warehouse and so on. You can, you can do something similar with uh, a concept called uh, uh, sketches uh, in, uh, in Druid. So you would pretty much take the overlap of a certain event and their timestamps, and then you're just building that funnel chart. Now, this is the console, uh, the, the web console, and uh, not a lot of us uh, love writing uh, SQL. Um, what about the uh, uh, drag and dropping? So, for example, we can do a similar thing here where we say, uh, give me the data for the past uh, three days. So we have uh, two 2,000 uh, reviews. This is a simple count, uh, but we can also say, uh, Hey, you know what? Actually, do uh, I want to see the trend of uh, my reviews compared to the previous uh, three days? So this is a quick uh, way to do some uh, uh, some trend and well, not trend analysis, but some deltas. Uh, and similarly, within the within this tool, we can say explain me this query, and then we in general we just copy paste this uh, this JSON, we adjust it a little bit, and then we pass it to to the We can do a similar thing in a time series manner. So uh, you pretty much get uh, uh, a delta in a, in a time series. Uh, thing. And then we can say, I want to give you the data for the last hour. So this is what we have. And we potentially can turn this on. We're not getting any reviews from our engine, but, but this is how the web console looks like. It can do SQL, and this is a uh, this is lighter standard SQL. This is used. Uh, this uses Apache Calcite. Uh, so just a, just a note there that there might be some limitation in the query limit. <laughs> so um, so <coughs> jumping to the learnings for us, it was really important to have a sponsor uh, who was our CTO to implement the first arch architecture, but also move towards uh, uh, Druid and uh, our marketing teams, our uh, commercial teams, our product teams are starting to use it as, uh, as a team. Uh, Druid is not magical. Uh, again, it's uh, the only offering that might be managed by a cloud provider is GCP. Uh, they have an alpha version of Druid on, on Datafrog. Uh, 
but Druid is not magical in the sense that uh, you have you can think of Druid as three layers. You have your infrastructure, you have your, your nodes, you have your data sources, uh, your tables, and then you have your uh, your queries. So you need to be careful with each step how you use it in, in general. You need to abstract as much as possible so you don't think uh, uh, the wrong thing. And this is uh, one of the points is uh, abstract the ingestion spec. Uh, we have stories where some of our Data platform engineers put the Druid cluster down because uh, they had too granular segments uh, and the garbage collector could not uh, keep up with uh, with the ingestion and uh, garbage of the whole system in memory. Uh, data is uh, immutable, so uh, you cannot uh, do update deletes. You can do that in uh, in ClickHouse, uh, but it, here you would have to re-ingest the whole uh, segment again. You can do that with uh, with lookups, but they are not as performant. So lookups are pretty much uh, joins that you would do to get the latest state of a of a dimension, and this will be done in memory, so it's not as uh, as performant. Uh, we learn to be careful at uh, at segment size. Again, we can take the uh, Druid cluster down. Uh, one way to also help uh, Druid uh, easily identify uh, where your segments are is to use something called uh, natural dimensions. So not high cardinality dimensions, but a lower cardinality. So for us would be something like uh, the type of uh, invitations we are sending. Is it a product invitation? So is it a, uh, a service invitation? Or it could be a country is also, uh, a country code is also a good dimension to have or a language given for the uh, final. Uh, if, if you do batch, ideally you would do rollups beforehand, uh, but uh, if uh, your cluster is big enough, I don't know, uh, if you have a cluster like Netflix, hundreds of millions of events a day, every day, uh, you can, uh, you might want to optimize those a little bit uh, through a batch process. Uh, monitoring and observability are extremely important uh, in this case, uh, I think in the last two versions. Uh, the team behind uh, Druid released uh, uh, a Prometheus emitter, emitter, so you can uh, push your metrics to Prometheus and have a performance access to see which segments have been brought, how, how many segments are being given by certain queries, and then you can optimize those segments further as well, so monitoring those case trades are really important. And then uh, be cost aware uh, as anything that you manage yourself. So it's a segment. Uh, you you can have uh, your JSON format or your uh, RTL format, but uh, Druid has its own uh, uh, segment format that would let you transform the data into. Yeah, so I can actually put my task query directly on it. That's okay. And the second question: What does it actually when you post your query to uh, Apache Druid? What does it actually return? What's the serialization format of uh, of Druid? Well, that's a good question. Uh, is Jason. Yeah. Uh, you said a uh, number of rows per segment size or segment. Is there any threshold of the size or is that you can have 400 rows and three terras or, or a segment or is, is uh, that good to come with an Apache Druid? Yeah, but uh, if you uh, if you have uh, 400 rows and then it's uh, three terabytes of data, then there's something wrong with the event. Uh, potentially you might find Way to optimize that. Yeah, well, obviously it's a perfect. But I mean, is there a uh, threshold or is it the max uh, size that I mean, you said? Uh, it, it depends how big your historical cluster is and uh, how much uh, data you can load. Okay, so if you have the capacity, you should be yeah. able to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Just your cluster size, but mm -hmm. not size, but uh, yeah. the So you have the big query in your in your infrastructure as well. I didn't know about the commercial 
was told to, I thought many of the things that you cannot solve was solved also by BigQuery with much less infrastructure. So, so why, what is it that uh, Ruid does that you couldn't solve with BigQuery and BigQuery BI engine optimization? Uh, so uh, for example, uh, it's really, uh, we have some internal term called data product within Trustpilot, which is the product, data product that we are giving our customers. So you, you will have your BI tool for uh, powered by uh, BigQuery for your internal users, but ideally we don't want to put an iframe in front of uh, our customers. We want to give them a natural feeling. So we, uh, in our case, uh, could use BigQuery API to purposes, uh, Druid made more sense for us than getting the BigQuery. I guess we have an internal dashboard where we like uh, we use the BigQuery, and I guess perhaps not for web interfaces, I, I haven't yeah. considered that, but for, for our internal users, it would, it would be just the same application. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, when we had in Druid some time ago, we were just doing a lot of uh, not, not using it because they say it's immutable and that, and that turned out to be a pain in dealing with, with personal uh, information and, 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 and GDPR and so on. Do, do we have that problem or, or, or have we just skipped that entirely or uh, do we handle it for that matter? How, how, uh, how do you handle it? Uh, in many cases we mask the data if we push uh, PII data, uh, but in many other cases uh, we, are aggregated the, we are aggregating the data so, so we can't map it to uh, a single entity. So I'm just trying to understand, like, with Druid, the storage is going to be separate for the compute. But in your case, like, where is that? And is it like a Druid sort of format in itself? So when you ingest from Prometheus, it'll write it in its own format. And if you stick it on S3, will it ingest that and rip somewhere else again? Uh, so in uh, in this case, uh, if you are ingesting real time, uh, the data will be loaded in uh, in memory and then uh, being dumped uh, on disk. The reason why we have the deep uh, storage is that's where the data will be uh, pushed from. Uh, let's say let's call it the real time node uh, where Prometheus and Kafka would push the data to. But then we want this data to be available, uh, or we want to scale horizontally. So we will have this is just. This is not just one node, this will be probably 10 nodes, 15 nodes. And then through it will, in order to load that data into the node, it will have to be done from, uh, from deep, deep storage where the segments are being stored. Uh, if that answers. So, yeah, uh, so the data is not being queried from deep storage, it's being queried from the data node itself because it's being loaded uh, into it from deep storage. So okay. but, uh, think of deep storage as a persistent storage. Okay. And that, the sources for that deep storage can be anywhere? Uh, yeah, so it can be uh, Google Cloud Storage and S3. Uh, these are, if I remember, uh, these were the last two sources that could be visible. That's it. That's cool. And then you get to the eventual consistency issue then, in this case, as opposed to you know, table log. Uh, no, because uh, uh, this is where internally Druid will know to take uh, some historical data from, uh, let's say, the historical nodes and then uh, some real data from the uh, real node, uh, real time node. So it will query across multiple uh, nodes in this case to retrieve the uh, data. So there is no detection. 
if you, uh, you said the, that was a fun answer, and you said it was given like 10 or 15 years or something. Uh, how does he know if you're streaming uh, that if it for a segment, if it's just uh, Miss Capture, for example, just going to hit one node, and that node is going to be responsible for soliciting that to the deep storage, and then that will be propagated to the other historical uh, nodes? Uh, because that, in, in that aspect, I would imagine that for Druid. Uh, doesn't know which node has the latest data for that type of event, that type of data, then it would depend on which it is, right? Because there's no common uh, field that it wouldn't know. Or do you have a leader node? or? Uh, so that's where the coordinator would be uh, aware of all the... Uh, okay, so it doesn't know which one it is. Okay. So there are some form of replication here? Uh, sorry? There is some form of a replication that happens across the nodes? Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, it doesn't happen from node to node, it's, it happens from node to deep storage to then the historical node, from deep storage to the historical node. Last question. I'll ask a question about the subject. Uh, Rora uh, just mentioned the test to help uh, who calculate it, it helps index. Why do you define Rora? Uh, it's uh, it's to, to pre calculate, so you don't want Druid to, uh, let's say you are dealing with an, uh, a, a query spec, uh, you don't want Druid to load two rows and then compress them and then return uh, or merge them. Uh, if the dimensions are the same, return uh, a two count in this case if you have two records, but we are just helping Druid in this case to merge those records uh, and then uh, set the metric of two in this case. But that then uh So if you have rollout enable, it can have a pull or uh, query responses until the data is dealing with the rollout. Super, thank you. <laughs> yes, we, we still have some beers to finish. Yeah, I hope nobody picked it up, so uh, <laughs> you have to rush out. And, and, uh, if not, we need to find them. Yeah. Where are the beers? <laughs>